Good evening, everyone, once again, and welcome to this week's Soul of the Parsha class. This Parsha is Parshat to the land of Israel. It's uh, in the background, it's about coming to the land of Israel. And as opposed to the previous Parsha, the previous Parsha had many, many different commandments and details. This one, not so much. What it does have, which is something very hard for many people to handle, is it has a lot of curses. It's the second time in the Torah that we have a long list of very hard to hear, hard to listen to curses that tell us in details different bad things that will happen to us if we don't observe the commandments. And it always raises many, many questions. So the first time was in um, Chumash Vayikra, uh, which is, I don't remember the, it's Genesis, Exodus, um, I forgot the, the English name for Vaikra. How, how is it called? So the third book of Moses, if someone can write it down, it would be nice. And um, Leviticus, sorry, yeah. So in the book of Leviticus, in Parashat Bechukotai, uh, that's the first list of curses we have, and this is the second time. It said that in this time, in some senses, this list is somehow milder or more mitigated it's easier to swallow. Why? The, the, the Gemara says the two reasons. One is that in the first incident in, in, in the Leviticus, it was God himself saying the curses. And now it's Moses saying the curses. So it's not as ominous or frightening or, or uh, intimidating. And the second is that the first set of curses was said in the plural form. It was about you in the plural, all of you together. And this time, it's individual. So it could be even more frightening, but this is presented as something that's, that's lighter in tone somehow. And in other senses, you can say it sounds actually worse. There are actually more curses in this parsha than in, in the Chukotai, in Leviticus. And also, when, when the, this parsha talks about the, the exile, that we're going to be exiled from our land, it doesn't give an end date. In the first instance you talked about, it's going to be uh, per numbers that you didn't observe the seventh year, the year of Shemitah. And that ended up being the 70 years of the first Babylonian diaspora. This parasha is interpreted as referring to the second temple diaspora, this diaspora we are currently in. And that doesn't have an end date. It's, it's longer. We don't know exactly how it's going to end. And uh, so this um, comes out of this parasha, the two sets of curses allude to future diasporas, one shorter and the other one longer that we're, we're still in the process of coming out of and trying to figure out how to do this. Um, now, either way, just having this set of curses, reading them every year is something, as I said, very hard to digest. And it's always a big question, why does God need to intimidate us so much? Why does he need to tell us all these very, very frightening neg negative things uh, that are going to happen to us if we don't observe the commandments. And it appears to, to uh, put us in a, in a kind of uh, fearful state that's not conducive to uh, serving God out of, out of joy, uh, which is another thing that's mentioned in this parasha. So, you know, throughout these weeks, I'm constantly mentioning Rabbi Adin Steinsatz because he passed away about two weeks ago. And I'm thinking about him reading his, his books again. So he says something very interesting about this. He says that uh, there's this constant argument between psychologists. And he says about every 15 years, they change their mind. And it's this kind of trend. Uh, whether it's positive or negative to expose young children to frightening stories and to the facts of life, to, 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 the, to the, you know, stark reality of how things really are, like be, there being death in the world and, and so on. And so every once in a while, either, so one time they say it's, it's very bad, the, the child should be very innocent and preserved. And, and then some other time they say, no, it's exactly the opposite. He needs to be, to be exposed to these things. And, and then he should know about them before, before he grows older. And ultimately what Rabbi Shtanzas does in this uh, talk is that he goes with this second opinion. I don't think he would support, you know, showing kids horror movies. Uh, but he is, he does support, and uh, letting them read uh, Parashat Kitavo. 
and reading about these curses, you know, it's not, if it's not visual, it's not traumatic for the child. On the other hand, it does uh, serve as a kind of vaccination in the sense that it prepares him for life in a world that's very uncertain, that a lot of really bad things happen in this world. It says if you grow up over-sheltered, and then you come out to the world and you have no preparation for how crazy life is and how extremely bad things can really happen to people. And it's no, it's no, it's no, it's no, it's not a fairy tale. It's not a bed of roses. It's something, life is something very hard. That's what life is all about. And you, you have to be prepared for this in, in advance, so to speak. So he says, that's why the Torah puts it and, and that's how it is. And then he tells a story, an amazing story that he once met a woman and he says she was the sole child survivor of the Vilna ghetto. There was this ghetto in Vilna and, and they, all, they, all, they were all, you know, killed by the Nazis. And, and she was the sole child survivor from, from that place. And, and her family was very not, non-observant, not from, they didn't observe anything. But she ended up doing tshuva. And the reason she did tshuva was because she read this parasha, which is Parashat Kitavo, and she said, I read it, and it made me believe in God, because I saw in my eyes that all these things actually came about. They were actually real. So you, you have no idea how things operate in this world. You know, you may think maybe everything should be sugar-coated or presented in a way that's, you know, palatable and presentable and everything is nice. But, but sometimes saying things as they are is, has a stronger effect on, on what happens. And, and you have this amazing example. Who would have thought that you have this person who went through the worst thing in the world and lost her entire family, but ended up doing tshuva, uh, returning to, to, to being observant and to observing the commandments, the Torah, to Yiddishkeit, uh, because, she, because of this parsha and because she says it's, it's true, it's all true. <laughs> so there's an amazing story. Now all this, even this description and this explanation for why we need this, it still remains on the, on the literal level and it's still quite harsh. However, there's a totally other level and, and way of looking at all of this, which is the more Hasidic aspect of things. And Hasidim don't like to leave things in their negative, literal sense. They like to turn things around and to make things that appear to be very bad, very evil, very harsh, um, very negative, to turn them upside down, to, to somehow discover that on the inside, if you really go deep into what they are and how they are, um, it, it, you suddenly see that it's all really good in its root. And, uh, and then we have this amazing story about, again, about the same parsha. The story is about the son of the first Rebbe of Chabad, he, 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 the future second Rebbe of Chabad. So the first Rebbe of Chabad, the Alter Rebbe, we call him, or the Rebbe Shneur Zalman of Ladi, he, other than being the Rebbe, he was also the person to read the Parsha every week in, in the synagogue. He would actually be the reader, the Baal Kore, who would read the Parsha. And every week he read the Parsha. But one, one time, it was this, this week's Parsha, Kitavo, he was away. And his son, again, the future second Rebbe, not yet 13, he was before Bar Mitzvah, he was 12 or 11. Uh, he, he sat there like he does every week and every year, and he heard the reader read the parsha, and then when he heard all the curses, he fainted. And then they 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 they, they rushed and they woke him up and they, they gave him some water, and then later they asked him, you know, you're not. It's not the first time you heard this parsha. Every every year you hear. You're not you're not very young. You're you've heard this many times. You've learned this many times. What 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 happened? It was the same thing that you heard last year and the year before that. So he says, no, no, you don't understand. When my father reads the parsha, you don't hear the curses. That's what he said. And it's an amazing story that really reflects something deep about Hasidic interpretation and Hasidic, the general atmosphere of Hasidut. It's not even an interpretation because when his father read the parsha, he didn't interpret it, he just read it. But the way, the incantation, the way, the, the energy, the the sort of soundtrack, you know, the way he read it made it seem as if it's no, not curses at all. It's all holy, good, positive words coming out of God's mouth or Mo, Moses' mouth. And there was no hint of anything ominous or negative going on. 
And this goes along with the fact that Hasidim, starting with the Baal Shem Tov, will take each and every curse and actually interpret it in a way that it becomes positive. And the result is, is a very, very interesting tension, which I think is a very basic tenet of what Judaism is all about. A very interesting tension between the literal, the pshat meaning, the literal level, and the drash meaning, the drash being the homiletic exegesis, the homiletic interpretation that goes deeper beneath the surface. So in the, on the literal level, it's, it's bad, it's harsh. And that's what Rabbi Shtanzatz was talking about. Sometimes you have to say it like it is, and you have to, to prepare us for a life in a world that appears to be extremely harsh and some really bad things could actually happen to you. By the way, now remember that in, on Shabbos, I, I heard a story, um, really, that I, the, the story is, is combined. It was a story about a, a, a soldier, a religious soldier in, the, in the, the War of the Day of Atonement, in 74, 73. And he, and he was going into, they were going into battle in Egypt, and um, and he he was the only religious soldier. He had he, he had the only pair of tefillin. And then the day before this very important battle, all it was Shabbat, it was Saturday. All of his soldier friends suddenly had this awakening. They all, all wanted to put on tefillin. And he told him, "Give us your tefillin. We want to put in your tefillin. We need this commandment. We don't observe, but we want this. Have this commandment before we go into battle." And he told him, "But it's Shabbat. On Shabbat, you don't put tefillin on." I said, we don't care. We don't care. We, this is, tomorrow we're going in early in the morning before sunrise. We have to do this. So he said, okay, take my tefillin, do whatever you want. And they all took their tefillin and put it on one by one, except one who was cynical. And he says, come on, this is, you think it's going to help. It doesn't help anyone. And he, he was the only one who didn't put on tefillin, except, of course, for this Froom guy who, who puts on every day, just not that, but he gave them his tefillin. And they went into battle the next day and something really frightening happened, which was that all the people who put on tefillin, including the guy who gave them the tefillin, nothing happened to them. And the guy who was cynical lost his arm. He lost his left arm. And he was rushed out of battle. And, and, and the guy who tells the story hasn't, didn't hear about him. And then many years later, he would tell this story again and again, and to many different groups, because it was something that he witnessed as miraculous. And it was part of a longer story, but that's the essence. And, and, um, and then he told this to someone, and someone in the crowd says, you know, I heard this story from a different angle. He says, who, do you, who did you hear it from? He says, I heard it from the guy who lost his arm. After the war, he did also tshuva, and he still regrets not being able to put on tefillin. He can't, but he did tshuva, and he observes commandments. So we don't know how it works. You know, I hate these stories when they're told in an educational way in order to frighten you, but these stories are real. So anyway, I was talking about this tension between one level which is what Rabbi Shtanda spoke about, which is saying things as they are because life is really, has these extremely harsh elements to it. But then another level flips it around and sweetens it all together. And you don't hear the curses. They stop being curses because the Torah has 70 facets and you can read things in all kinds of deeper and deeper ways. And the thing is, they don't contradict. You don't lose the literal meaning, right? There's this principle that says, en mikra yotemidei pshuto, no Torah verse can ever be, uh, can ever lose its literal meaning. You can't take away its literal meaning. So, but on the other hand, it's not the only meaning, it's just one level. So this tension is very, very vital to the understanding of Judaism. You have the literal meaning, it's there, it has its purpose, but you can also go really, really deep into it, and Hasidus is the most radical in reinterpreting all the way to flipping things around. So all this was just an introduction, and now we want to go into a particular curse, and we want to see how the Hasidim reinterpreted it, and we're going to learn a very important Hasidic principle that's really serviceable to our lives, each and every one of us as individuals, also as a people, also on many, many different levels. So the, the, the verse in this parasha, I'm going to read it in Hebrew, and then I'm going to translate it twice. The way I saw it in, in Art Scroll, the, the basic translation, famous, uh, very widespread translation, and I'm going to retranslate it just to have the nuances. So the Hebrew verse goes like this, Ve'hayu chayecha tluim lecha minneged, ufachadet alayla ve'yomam, 
ולא תאמין בחייך. So, the article translation goes like this. The life you face shall be precarious. You shall be in terror night and day with no assurance of survival. This is a very frightening verse. A more precise, worthy translation would be like this. Not you, the life should be precarious, but literally it means your life shall hang in front of you. Right? Precarious, when something is precariously poised, is something like hanging. It's hanging on a thread. So it says your life shall hang before you, and then you shall fear night and day. That's the same. And then it says, again, the previous translation went, no assurance of survival. But the literal meaning is, you shall not have faith in your own life. You won't be able to trust your own life, right? Lota amin bechayecha. You won't be able to believe, to have faith in your own life. You don't know if you're, right, if you're going to live or not going to live. That's, but the literal meaning is, is the, your life shall hang in front of you, and you shall fear night and day, and you won't believe in your life. Okay, so the Baal Shem Tov, founder of Hasidut, first generation, takes this verse and says the following, right? I'm going to paraphrase in my own words, but what he says is the following. He turns this curse into a piece of advice, a very positive, helpful, constructive piece of advice that we should all take to heart. And he says the following. He says, everything good that you do, every good deed, every commandment you observe, every prayer, every something good that you do as part of God's service, as part of whatever it is that you do in your life, after you do it, don't be, never be pleased with, your, with yourself. Never succumb to, uh, to smugness. Don't be smug about it. Don't be uh, over-pleased with yourself. Look for the little bit that wasn't good enough, focus on that, and next time try to improve even that. Find a little bit of thing that was egoistical, that was for your own sake, not for its own sake, and, and work on that. And then you save yourself from the worst enemy of growth, which is complacency. It says complacency is the worst thing in the world because it convinces you that you're already okay if you're already okay. You have nothing to learn, nothing to evolve, to develop into. So he, he says, you should have your, your life should hang before you. That is, you should constantly reflect upon your life. That's how he reads the verse. Your life shall hang before you in the sense that it's constantly reappraising what you did instead of resting on your laurels, right? Don't rest on your laurels. Don't be smug put it before your face reflexively and critically and find a little thing that you could have done better and focus on that on the next day. And, and, and the constant fear, the, the fear night and day, is again, is a fear. He says that we should serve God with both love and fear, but it says but we should constantly refine the love and fear. So we should have this constant, the fear here is the fear of not serving God in a way that's, that's even better than, than the previous day. And if you want to be in this state of mind that you constantly work, you're constantly on the alive, really, and working on who you are, then you should, you should heed this advice. Hang, have your life hanging before you. Constantly have this fear that you could be doing better. And you won't believe in your life. Again, in a positive sense, it means you won't have this self kind of, you know, believe in yourself could be something very positive, it could also be something very negative. If someone believes in oneself, it could replace God. You believe in your, you become your own, taken to an extreme, it's your own idol. You, you start serving yourself instead of serving God. So don't idolize yourself in any way. Don't idealize yourself. And don't see everything that you do as perfect. Because then, again, you become complacent, you become smug, and then you'll fall. That's, complacency is the mother of, of uh, you know, tripping over and, and sinning and making more mistakes. So, but, but if you're constantly in this state of vigilance and work, then you're constantly growing. So that's what the Baal Shem Tov did. Now, in the, some gener- few couple of generations later, you have Baal Shem Tov's great-grandson, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, and he coined 
a term that really is an, a continuation of this idea, but it's a wonderful, very solid, very basic Hasidic term, which is just him giving a name to what his great-grandfather said in this, in this idea. He said, one should constantly, when one is doing tshuva, right, tshuva is repentance, one should constantly also do tshuva al ha repenting over your repentance or repenting on your repentance. He says, you're doing tshuva, that's a wonderful thing, but then if you become complacent, this tshuva becomes something very superficial or external or just another habit. So you should constantly be doing a tshuva ala tshuva. And he uses a, 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 a verse from Proverbs, which says two words. It says, taharti michatati, Literally, it means I have purified myself from my sin. Taharti, I have purified myself. Michatati, from my sin. But he twists it and he says, I have purified myself from the way I said I have sinned yesterday. Chatati is chatati aviti pashati, I have sinned. So yesterday I said I have sinned, but then the next day I have to say, and now I need to purify myself not from my sins, because I don't, I'm not sitting anymore in a, in a, you know, in a clear-cut way or in a way that's obvious. I'm, I've become, you know, religious or I've become observant or whatever. But now I have to purify myself from the way I did, the way I said I have sinned yesterday or the way I did tshuva yesterday. So he calls this tshuva ala tshuva, repenting over the repentance. And if you want to find a nice English term, you can call this and this could be the heading for, for this class, repent, comma, repeat, right? It's just one letter apart. You take the, the N and you turn it into an A, and you have repent, repeat. There's a very famous pop song that goes, eat, sleep, love, repeat. And it's been paraphrased to death by hundreds of people. It could be eat, sleep, music, repeat, or eat, sleep, uh, take drugs, repeat, or whatever it is. Eat, sleep, something, repeat. So we're going to call this class Eat, Sleep, Repent, Repeat. Right? That's the name of our class. We want to repent. We want to live. That's eating and sleeping. And then we want to, to repent for the way we did it. And then we want to repeat the repentance. So now what are we going to do now in the rest of, this, of, in, of our time, the remaining of our time, is we're now going to look at three interpretations um, of what it means to do tshuva ala tshuva, or to repent over our repentance, to go into a fine-tuning of repentance, right? That's the idea. Tshuva ala tshuva is to fine-tune the repentance, because doing it on, a, on, a, on a one level is one thing, and then going into a high, high res, that's another image we can use. The first tshuva, the first repentance is low res, low resolution tshuva. Second is high resolution tshuva, going into the finer details. Okay, so three levels, three ways of interpreting this. So the first, and that's, that's the simple one, is on the individual level. That's what both the Baal Shem Tov and his grand-grandson, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, that's what they meant. That's what they were talking about. And in this sense, it's going from an external tshuva to an internal tshuva. And, and really what it means is the following. It means that whenever you do tshuva, for what it, whatever it is, you, you, you lived your life in a wrong way, you did something wrong, you misbehaved, you lied, or you, you were angry, or whatever it is. And then the first tshuva you did, it's very important. But the next day, or after some time, you have to realize that that's how it is. When you first do tshuva, it's going to be relatively superficial, or relatively external, compared to a finer, deeper, more inner kind of tshuva that you can do as you mature. And you have to reflect upon this. You have to realize, and the, the simplest example is someone who grew up secular, and then they, they grow a beard, and they put on a yarmulka, and they, you know, they, they start observing Shabbos, they start eating kosher, and they change their life externally. It's very easy, well, it's very hard, but it's also very e relatively easy to change the outside of things, but their inner character traits, that's something much harder to work on. So you can put on a, 
a costume. You can, you know, put on the costume of, of someone who's religious. And it's no little thing. It's no small thing. But if you want to go on doing tshuva, being a constant Baal tshuva, you have to constantly uh, strive to adopting a, a, a more internal tshuva. And he said that the tshuva I did yesterday was, was more on the outside. Now I want to go deeper into my character traits, into the way I think, and the way I feel, and the way I behave, not just on the outside, also on the inside, to my family, to my, to my close, to my spouse, to my children. And, and even then, when you do the more internal tshuva, the next day, or after some time, you should say, you know what, even this was not as internal as it can be. Even this was a little bit chitzami, a little bit on the outside, a little bit for show, a little bit you know, just going through the motions. Now, I want to not just go through the motions. I want to really, really want to strike it even deeper into my, into my heart and into the way I behave. And then you're in a constant flow, in a constant growth, you know, this arc or this constant, you know, growth of, of doing tshuva. And that's how it should be. So on the individual, that's the, the first level, the simple level, that's what the Baal Shem Tov and Rabbi Nachman were talking about, is each and every one of us in our individual lives going from a more external tshuva to a more internal one, and then further and further into more finer and deeper and more subtle levels and ways of doing tshuva. So that's the first level. Second level is not the individual level, it's the collective level. What do I mean by collective level? So when we say the word tshuva, I, I used up until now, I used the word repent, to repent, repentance. But literally, what tshuva means is return. The Baal tshuva, the, the, the one who does tshuva, is a returnee. He returns to something. Who, who does he return to? What does he return to? He returns to God. He returns to his own soul. He returns to the customs of his, of his forefathers, his Jewish forefathers. Or if it's a convert, it's to the, the, to the forefathers of his soul, his neshama, his Jewish neshama, his Jewish soul. It's returning to the root of his soul from, and, 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 the, and it, the place it belongs to. But when, when you look at, at the Tanakh, at the Bible, when the Bible talks about returning, it mostly talks about returning to the land of Israel. So when we're going from the individual to the collective level, we need to talk about the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel. Shivat Zion, the return to Zion. And this is a big tshuva. This is not just an individual tshuva, this is a collective tshuva. The fact that in, in our generation, almost half of the Jewish people are in the Jewish land, in Eretz Israel, is, is something amazing. This is the beginning of Shiva Tzion, there's no doubt about it. it we can argue about the details, about what it means, the Jewish state, and so on. But the fact that preceded the founding of the Jewish state, the, the, the waves of Jews returning to the land, it's a kind of tshuva. It's a collective kind of tshuva. However, also on the collective level, we need to work on tshuva ala tshuva. Return a deep, going from a, a more external kind of return to a deeper one, or in this level we can talk about going from a physical return to a spiritual return, and we can say the following: We have returned, or many Jews have returned, and are still returning. Now the COVID crisis is awakening a lot more new immigrants, more olim chadashim to the land of Israel and may they all increase and more and more Jews return to their homeland. However, as we go through this process of all coming back to our land, we need to remember that this is just a physical return. We can all return to the land of Israel, but if we return to the land of Israel, but the kind of culture we set up here and the kind of mentality that we cultivate and the kind of uh, atmosphere that we, we we create here is one that has, is not really connected to what Judaism is all about, to what sanctity, to Shai is all about. If we are physically here, but our minds and our hearts are maybe in Hollywood or in India or in all kinds of places, 
then we just did a chitzoni, an external physical kind of return. There's, there was this, this very famous poem by Rabbi Yudha Levi that uh, he said, uh, um, My heart is in the east, in Eretz Israel, in Jerusalem, but physically I am somewhere far away to the west. I'm in Spain. And, but my heart is not here. My heart is in, in the east, in Eretz Israel. But unfortunately, it can be that we can experience the same thing in the opposite. When we live here, we can be that physically we're in Eretz Israel, but our heart is somewhere in the west, somewhere in like, or in the far east, or whatever it is. So, tshuva la tshuva, going from a physical return to a spiritual return, is now preceding to, or proceeding, sorry, proceeding to Shivat Zion spiritually, returning to Judaism, to Jewish values, to Jewish learning, not just being on the outside. It's not enough to physically, geographically be in the land of Israel. So Tshuva La Tshuva in the collective sense is, as Rabbi Karlebach would sing, return again to the land of your souls. We, many Jews have returned to the land of our forefathers, but we, not, we have not necessarily returned again, re-return or again repent and repeat the, the repentance, returning again to the land of our souls. So this is the collective level. So on the individual level, it's moving from uh, external tshuva to internal tshuva. And on the collective level, it's us as a people moving from physically into the land of Israel and then also spiritually to the spiritual land of Israel, the land of our souls, the land of Kedusha and Torah and Emunah, and the true soil of our souls uh, from which we really grow and, and, and are nourished. So that's the second level. Third level, very interestingly, is a combination of the first two. The combination is that we can talk about a tshuva la tshuva, a repentance over the repentance, going from the individual tshuva to the collective tshuva. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So now we have uh, someone who was a Zionist, and he's very proud about living in the land of Israel and, you know, uh, manifesting the, the Zionist dream. But then he realizes it's only superficial, it's only physical, and he needs to do this kind of spiritual return to Zion on a deeper level. So it becomes about tshuva. And what he does immediately is that he focuses on building himself as an individual. This is what Balei Tshuva do. They realize they have to completely reorganize, reshift in their heads how their life appears, how they wake up in the morning, how they go through their day, what they do in their day, how they conduct whatever it is they eat, and, and how they do business, and how they marry, and how they raise their kids. And it all, all remains on the very, uh, uh, on the level of the individual life. On the level of the individual, you change your life completely. And it's very interesting because for many people who, when they were secular, they had the whole world open before them. They could be in the arts and sciences and politics and a lot of different things. But when they go to tshuva, many of this, they have to let go of these dreams and they focus on their individual tshuva, their individual return. So, of course, this is amazing and incredible. And it should be encouraged with all the words of encouragement there are. However, when, we, when you think about the idea of having your life hanging before you and constantly fearing that you maybe could be doing more, you need to also do tshuva over the tshuva, which in this case would be going, advancing from an individual tshuva to a tshuva that takes responsibility over your surroundings. And this is harder to do. Before, when we just spoke about the individual level, we spoke about just going into finer and find more and more into myself, more and more into what's, how I could be changing the way I talk, the way I behave, the way I think, the way I feel, and so on. Now we're talking, apparently, or on the surface, something the very opposite, but really, really goes together. We're talking about not going deeper and more and more into yourself, because then you're just staying on the individual level. 
We're talking about moving from the individual to the collective, reclaiming the part of you that it would take responsibility and think, you know, in in larger scale way about how can I influence society? How can I change society for the better? How can I influence not just my community, all of my culture, if it's Israeli culture, if it's whatever country that I'm living in, the Jewish community, even beyond that, to the, to the entire world. What can I give to the rectification of the entire world? So the idea is that this is really a combination of the two. And very interestingly, it doesn't contradict the first idea, which is that you're going to finer and finer details because it goes together. The more you confront other people, other opinions, other places, other challenges, that forces you to refine yourself in finer and finer, deeper and deeper ways. It really goes to the first level of tshuva, of tshuva ala tshuva, and the third level of tshuva ala tshuva, they appear to be going in opposite directions. They're really going in the same direction. The more you go into the outside, the more you face who you really are, and you're able to rectify yourself in a deeper way. And I'm going to finish this with a story that's a very famous Hasidic story, but I'm going to give a Chabad twist in the end to this story. So the famous story about someone who decided they want to change the world, they want to fix the world, they want to make the world a better place, they want to save the world, redeem the world. So this person started studying about all the different cultures and the geopolitical problems of the world, and he wanted to f- create world peace and solve all the problems in the world. And of course, he quickly realized it's far beyond any one person's lifetime. There's no way he could do it. So he decided to narrow down and just rectify his own country. Just one country. He's going to fix all the problems in just his country. And he started learning about all the problems in the history and the sociology and the economics. Again, at some point he realized this is far too much for one person. I can't, it's, I can't handle this. So I'm just going to rectify my own city. And then he narrowed it down to just his own neighborhood and then just his own house. And finally he realized that he can't even properly rectify or or control or change his wife and kids. There's only one person he can really work on, which is himself. And then that's how the classical version of the story ends, is that he realized you can only rectify yourself and you should focus on rectifying yourself. But however, there is an additional ending. There's another addition to the story, which goes, which sort of, the, we, we have the end, right? We have the end title. But now there's suddenly a post-credit scene. And the post-credit scene of this other version goes that after a while, he realized that even he himself is a bottomless pit of issues and complexes that he can never, ever solve in a lifetime. And because he's, he's, every individual is so complex, so he can't even rectify himself. So he says, okay, well, if I'm going for something infinite that you can never do in any lifetime, I might as well go back to rectifying the entire world, to going for tikkun olam. And that's what he did. And this is a very interesting thing to add to this whole idea. So what he did was tshuva la tshuva in the sense that he went deeper and deeper refining into himself. But according to this alternative ending, what happened in the end was that he realized now, as, I, as I'm focusing on myself, I realize that the true rectification of who I am is to go back and assume responsibility in as much as I can. I'll contribute my part. Of course, now he's going back to rectifying the entire world far more humbly than he did before. Before, he imagined he could do everything. Now he knows he can barely do anything. But he, he also knows that what he can do he should do, he needs to do. So this for him is the tshuva la tshuva, returning over the returning, repenting over the repenting. He, he didn't just repent for the previous, you know, delusion of grandeur, of thinking you can rectify everyone when you're not even solving your own problems. He passed all this. He, rec- he started working on himself. There's this famous psychologist that says, before you go and, f- and save the world, try and see if you can fix, if you can clean your own room if you can make your day, make a schedule for your own day. And this is what this story is about, except for the end. In the end is after this humility of seeing that I, can't, I can barely take control of my life, I need to go back and try and give my best to the rest of society also. And this also rectifies me 
as an individual. It really goes together because I become more humble and more rectified the more I confront other people's problems and try to help them also. And I also help them using the fact that I suffer with them, that I, I know what they feel like. So this is our, our, our story for today. And it really connects to the name of the parasha, which is Kitavo, as you come into the land. We ultimately put it all together because we spoke about the curses, and from the curse, we went to the particular curse of your life precariously hanging before you. And we took this into the idea of tshuva la tshuva, repent and repeat. And we ended up under, understanding in a deeper way what it means to come, to come to the land of Israel, to return to the land of our souls. So this is our share for today. I hope you liked it. And I'll see you all next week.